Welcome all to, uh, well, looks like we've got about an hour together and uh, um, many of you will want to ask me about the slides for this presentation. You're welcome to ask, but I'm telling you now there aren't any. <laughs> well, but you know what, make your own. Um, be creative. I, I, encourage, I encourage initiative and uh, I'm keen to see what you come up with. You think I'm kidding. Um, I was uh, teaching a course recently in Melbourne and one of my uh, trainees takes notes in the form of doodles, except these doodles look like full color, watercolor pictures. It's really amazing. Um, so yeah, feel free. Um, I'm not doing slides. One of the reasons I'm not doing slides is because I am improvising. And the main reason I'm improvising is because I don't really know who you folks are. I don't know who my audience is. So just give me some idea. How many people here are students? This includes postgrad students. Don't be shy. I was one once too. The trauma recedes after a decade. Um, <laughs> who's here actually working in data analytics out there in the big bad world? Wow, quite a few of you. Any journalists? <laughs> <laughs> Clergy, <laughs> zookeepers, special, specializing in zebras. <laughs> I'm a data scientist. Data scientists are always curious. Data scientists, I, the best ones have ADHD. So if you're a data scientist and you haven't completely an opportunity thought about zookeeping, you're probably not a good data scientist. Um, okay, so uh, quite quite a mixed bunch. Quite a mixed bunch. Um, one thing I don't do is put out a poll and ask you what you all want to talk about. I was actually, I gave a talk last week, which was the result of a poll, poll. and the topic that came up was a topic that I thought was, well, beneath the, beneath the panel, actually, although the panel disagreed, and I said some rather controversial things, but that, that's a whole different story. So, um, in terms of the promised presentation, in terms of the format of the promised presentation, I'm supposed to tell you a little bit about data science and analytics and a little bit about its future. And let's talk about how this sort of, still having a meta conversation right now, I'm talking about the talk count. Let's talk about how this talk might have been different 10, 10 years ago, or even 20 years ago. So if, if I was having, if I was presenting this talk 20 years ago, I would have to start off by saying, well, there is this thing called data, and there is this thing called analyzing data, and possibly even making decisions from it. And people go, who would ever want to do that? Yeah. And if I was having this talk with you 10 years ago, I'd probably not work too hard to convince you that there is a role for some level of reporting and measurement in, in business and that you all would have some experience with you know, advanced technology like Microsoft Excel. But if I were to veer into things like machine learning, you'd all go, machine what? Um, and if I were to suggest that maybe there is more to actually running a business and making business decisions than just doing a little bit of arithmetic, you know, adding things up, maybe subtracting them and, taking ratios, that there was more to the world than that, that would, uh, that would certainly challenge a lot of people. <coughs> but we're not in that world now. So now we're in a world where the term AI is ubiquitous. So everyone's heard of it. Do people know what it is? Well, uh, that's debatable. Um, and like all good, insidious buzz phrases that sort of come in from many different sides. You know, some people are thinking about it in terms of self-driving cars. Some people are thinking about it in terms of taking away people's jobs in, in the white collar workspace. Um, some people are thinking about killer robots and military applications. In fact, there's a whole lot of stuff about physical robots, which I find kind of annoying because I, I think the physical robots are, yeah, interesting, but beside the point. When, when the singularity kills us, it won't be physical robots. It'll be modulus algorithms switching off our air suppliers. Um, yeah, I, I don't think the singularity is happening just yet, so don't panic, folks. We've got at least two weeks. Um, so 
We're at a point where there is a general, I would say ubiquitous, popular understanding of the, the existence and the importance and the potential ubiquity across all aspects of life of things that I've spent my whole life studying, yeah? So I should be really happy. In fact, why am I here? Why am I not on my private Caribbean island? Why island singular? I should have 12, right? There with my, I don't know, pet giraffe, teaching the pet giraffe to surf and doing all the other things multi-billionaires do because this is it. I was doing a PhD over 20 years ago, slaving away and then getting out of the workforce and I didn't even have a word, I literally didn't have a word to describe to recruiters to tell them what I did. Now, it's interesting because Anne over there introduced herself to Matt to quite confidently say, well, I've known Eugene longer than anyone here. And in fact, she hasn't because Matt's known him longer. But um, Annie was one of the few people who, you know, when I met her, I thought, oh my God, you're like someone I can talk to because she was actually doing neural nets in a commercial context. So we didn't have words like data scientists. In fact, the word data miner, which is now an extinct word, wouldn't, wouldn't, you know, it wouldn't, wouldn't appear until later. I, so from, from where I came from right now, we're in a world where all this stuff that I studied is suddenly really, really, really important and I should be happy. And I'm seeing a whole lot of people, possibly many of you, either aspiring to or actually journeying forth to join in the fun, to do mostly Masters of Data Science. Yeah, how many Masters of Data Science students here or graduates? Be honest, it's not that bad. There's, there's still a chance. Yeah, the uh, the only hope I think is to do a Masters of Stats. Okay, I'm being I'm being facetious, but there is a point that I make to every single person who comes along and asks me, "Well, I want to get into this field. What do I do?" And they usually ask it in the context of being halfway through some kind of data science masters, and I, I have to, I have to, because, hey Lorraine, hello, very, very clever person. Are there any other quantum computing PhDs in the room? I didn't think so, very clever person. And quantum computing is a fascinating field. And looking to revolutionize data science as well, so it's not irrelevant. Um, a little bit of unsolicited advice. I did, a, I, I did my bachelor's in computer science and pure maths, and I did a PhD in computer science. What I can tell you is that in the bachelor's degree, all the computer science I learned was obsolete by the time I graduated. So we're talking early 90s, it was already obsolete in the early 90s. Pure maths I learned was incredibly valuable and remains incredibly valuable to this day, especially because of the advent of quantum computing. Um, now I'm saying this to make another point, which is I never learned stats as an undergraduate. I, um, in my tie-dye t-shirt, I did the kinds of things that people in tie-dye t-shirts do, which was not attend my stats classes in, in first year. So what little stats I had to offer me as a computer science student in, in my undergrad, I ignored. I had to learn stats the hard way in my PhD. So I, not by attending classes, by learning from a book. And I can tell you that's not an easy thing to do. Not one book, many books. But I can tell you another thing. It's only when you learn stats that you realize how valuable it is. The thing about stats is um, it, it, it's about if you don't know stats, you don't know what you don't know. You don't know what concepts you're missing. You don't know what, what ways you can describe reality. Like it is a language. It's a language and it's a system of concepts and you don't know that those things exist to learn them. So it's very hard to explain to you what the value of statistics is other than to say when you analyze data, data speaks a language. Data wants to talk to you, it speaks a language. That language is the language of uncertainty and structure. That's all statistics is. Statistics is just a language of uncertainty and structure. But the ability, the ability to look at a data set and infer from it rather bizarre concepts dealing in uncertainty and structure and then turning them into reality, into business decisions, 
into applications, into, into ideas, but particularly about the decisions about the real world, that's, that is what sets a real data scientist apart from someone who, I guess, just pushes data around with a machine. So if you, if, you, if you fancy yourself a data scientist, but you don't have very, very serious statistics, um, that's not a data scientist in my book. And here's another thing. The data science field, it is very popular. It is very popular. Everybody wants to do it, sure. And the funny thing is, there's, there's a market for it. I'm in that market. I teach courses, yeah. I teach courses because people want to learn, but I know something else too. That a lot of people would be really a whole lot happier with courses if those courses made them feel really good about themselves and really empowered. Now, that means that uh, you don't want to make those courses too hard, do you? But university courses are a little bit different. A university course, well, universities have a reputation to protect in terms of the standard. And what's more, universities require you to prove that you meet that standard with exams and with marks and things like that. Um, so I, all I'm trying to say to you is that when people ask me, well, what kind of data science masters should I do? And this is, I mean, admittedly, without investigating deeply into what all the universities have to offer in terms of data science masters. I'm just, I, just make, I just make a conservative call on something that I, sh I strongly believe and something I look for in people I want to work with or people I hire. And I say, do a master's in stats. Because a lot of the reaction is often, oh, what book should I get to read up on stats? And I go, okay, you've just done your master's in data science and you think data science is this really big field and stats is this little thing that's missing, yeah? Well, that's not the right way to think about it. The right way to think about it is there's this great big thing called stats, and there's this little thing called certain areas of applied stats, which, which is all machine learning really is, which you never really understand if you just learn it as an algorithm. Learning, learning machine learning without understanding stats, one of my favorite analogies is it's like learning poetry or a song by heart in a language you don't understand. You can recite the song or you can implement the algorithm, but you don't really know what you're doing. You can't really improvise. You certainly can't really come, you can't come up with any new songs in that language. You are, uh, well, you're, you're, you're operating at a different level. And I also find that people who have a background in, well, writing algorithms, just writing algorithms, find picking up stats really, really, really hard. But people who have a mathem the mathematical training, the statistical training, picking up a little bit of programming and a few more algorithms and, and, and a bit of theoretical computer science is relatively easy. Um, you may disagree and I'm, you know, I may be wrong. And I'm now using a, a uh, kind of appeal to, I guess, appeal, appeal to plurality argument where I say that I've yet to meet anyone who tells me that, uh, that uh, computer science is harder to learn than statistics. Um, so don't undervalue statistics. And remember, point I, point I didn't quite make earlier because I was rambling, because it's really easy to study algorithms, because it's really easy to learn to code, because it's really easy to do all that side of things, there's a lot of people doing it. Um, already, out in the business world, I'm hearing about a glut of data scientists. Well, my reaction is, well, there's a glut of people who call themselves data scientists. But the point is, the barrier to entry for all these for all these courses can be quite low. I'm not saying it's true for every single data science masters out there, but I am saying I have seen products of data science masters who, well, they have a fair bit to learn. On the other hand, when you, what, when you hear what I'm saying now, a lot of people are going, that's terrible, that can't be right, thank God no one else is saying it because I'm going to ignore it, because stats is icky, stats is horrible. Well, let me tell you, um, as, as someone who's trying to be kind and trying to share with you some, some heartfelt advice that might help you, I'm telling you this, right? But as your potential competitor in the business world, when you graduate and you're out there and you're up against the likes of me, I'm really happy that I know stats and you don't. I'm, I'm serious. I'm really happy about my competitive advantage over you. Now, um, I, I'm, 
they're probably not that cold hearted. <laughs> you know, we're not really competing. We're at different points in our careers and all that. But the truth is that you're actually competing with many, 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 many people. If, if what you've got is a sort of, yeah, you know, entry level data science, I can do a bit of character competition. If that's what you've got, okay, you're doing fine. And so, and so is everybody else. Um, what sets you apart? What makes you a unicorn? What's going to get you to progress in, in a career in data analytics? What's, what's, going to, what's going to help you get noticed by, uh, you know, by Alpha Zeta as an actual expert? What's going to set you apart? It's the stuff that's so difficult that other people don't want to touch it. And that's what stats is. Now, some people are blessed with a lot of stats. I can tell you I detested mathematics in high school. In, in university, I suddenly developed a love for mathematics, but I continued to detest statistics. So only when I got to my PhD that I continued to detest statistics, but realized that without it, I was doomed. And then I actually fell in love with it. It was a very, it's a very strange experience. There must be some kind of massacres. But um, what I'm trying to tell you is what makes, what makes statistics scary is what make, makes it a true advantage. A real advantage is hard to acquire. And uh, I, think, I think we can all do with a badge of hand, yes? So I'm not sure if this is a, this is a interactive thing at all, but I just wanted to ask, you say stats is important, but like how much stats, what level of stats you need to do? Like what are you proposing in terms of this learning of stats? Um, well, Dave, I would conservatively say master's level is a good start, which is another way of saying way more than most people would be even comfortable with considering, and as much as necessary, as much as possible. Uh, let's just say that at the end of my PhD, I knew just enough stats to realize how much I, I didn't know, it, which was almost any. And that, that's a really that's a, I know that's a, you hear people say stuff like that all the time. It sounds a bit trite. No, I really mean it. I'm not, I'm not coining a term. I'm saying I learned a few mathematical methods and a few mathematical tricks. I learned a few mathematical facts, which opened my eyes to how amazing it is. But more importantly, I realized how far behind I was if I wanted to do what I was doing seriously. I realized that the people in, in neural nets, which is my field, the people who were really at the forefront of neural nets, they were basically speaking a, 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 a different language. You know, I, I think I had the experience. Uh, do you all, do any of you have a dog? You know, what it's like to have a dog, yeah? And the thing is, the dog really, really loves you, yeah? It wants to hang out with you. And, you know, it particularly wants to hang out with the kids. The dog thinks it's a member of the family. And if the dog doesn't get to hang out with other dogs, I, I don't know how scientific this is, but I've heard it said that the dog thinks it's a person. <laughs> yeah? Now, I think at the end of my PhD, I was like a dog thinking I was a neural net practitioner. <laughs> and, I, you know, I, I hung out with neural net practitioners. I played, you know, you're playing, if playing frisbee was like neural nets, a dog can play frisbee, right? But I'm still, there was still something that they were all doing that I wasn't. And that thing, that language, that way of relating to data was statistics. Oh, I'm not finished, folks. I'm not finished. Because the, I think the thing that gets you to the point where you're a player is statistics. But even folks who are good with statistics might be missing the next bit. In fact, they almost certainly are. So now let's talk about what I consider to be elite data science both in terms of how hard it is and in terms of how crucial it is in the context of making the most important decisions out there. Let me tell you something about statistics. Ever heard the expression correlation does not imply causation? Yes. Yes. Now, all of statistics without some additional, with additional doodads, say, come on. Sorry. Buddy, come 
ego. So, um, you climb the mountain of trying to acquire an adequately mediocre level of statistical knowledge, which is all that I claim these days. And Matt will probably say, no, nah, Eugene, you're not even damaged. But, you know, I'm certainly nowhere near <laughs> master level. Um, and I think I have enough stats to at least realize how advanced people like Matt, people like Connor in the field, field of stats. But even with the stats I have, it's not enough. And I came to this realization late in life that there's one more thing that I was missing completely. Um, I'll step back a bit and talk about data science. I have a very uh, um, I guess a very ironic take on what it takes to be good at data science. You need to be good at two things, right? You need to be good at data, and you need to be good at science. <laughs> and being good at data is the stats bit. So my point is that most data scientists don't even make point one. Yeah? So being good at data, being able to talk to data, means knowing stats. But that alone is not enough. Because it turns out that all of stats, without some additional important bells and whistles developed by people like Javier Pearl, is about correlation. So stats, sort of, without the correlational bit, very, very helpful. And by the way, don't let anyone tell you that correlation alone is useless. Don't let anyone tell you that every business problem is a causal problem, because it's not. Um, don't let anyone tell you that just because correlation doesn't imply causation. Uh, another thing you could say is it depends on how you define imply. <laughs> you might either mean to imply absolutely or hint. Yeah, so uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's true, but it's kind of so it's not it's not as hard it's not as hard as people think. But but understanding science means not just not just being able to infer things from the data in terms of what the data, it's not it's not looking at what the data is saying. If you understand science, you can start understanding what your data is not saying. So science lets you be skeptical about your data in ways that statistics alone might not let you be. And science also lets you, I see you work, thanks for coming in. Science is all about experiments these days, yeah? It's all about randomized control trials, which are itself a statistical idea. So science and modern, modern science and stats live side by side. And if you want to dismiss everything I said before about stats not being about science, it just depends where you draw the line. So there is certainly a lot of a lot of stats in support of science, and particularly in support of experimentation. But here's the really interesting part. The most powerful, the most advanced, the most important data analytics you can do is the data analytics you do to answer the really big questions. And what I mean by big questions is, like, you know, should, we rise, should we raise Australia's uh, uh, bond rate? Should the Reserve Bank rise, rise, raise our interest rate? Um, you can't answer that question experimentally because it's very hard to find spare Australians and it would probably be unethical to do a randomised controlled trial on them and it would probably take too long, yeah? I don't know. Well, with many worlds interpretation of quantum mechanics, it may be possible, what do you think, Lorraine? Um, but uh, the important thing is that just because you can't do an experiment doesn't mean you throw away your statistical rigour your, your philosophical rigor, and a kind of almost insane level of mental simulation where you're simulating, well, what if we had a world where we could do experiments? And it turns out that econometricians are one group of people who do this mind-breaking kind of mathematical, non-experimental causal impact for a living, which is why, well, I know we've got at least two in the room. There's con there's ego and they're absolute legends. Um, Non-causal impact inference is really, really, really hard and really and increasingly important. So uh, I'm not saying that you should all just go out and do econometrics degrees tomorrow, although you know that might not hurt. And when I say you should do a master's in stats, I think a master's in econometrics is about as well, possibly even better, especially because it covers some of this causal impact stuff. So not knowing what I was going to talk about, 
this evening and uh, uh, sort of naturally segueing into this particular topic, if only because I was being asked about this topic by someone in the audience just, just prior to the commencement of the talk. Um, and also because, uh, because, because Matt is hosting it, and I think it's as fine a time as any to, uh, to reinforce a message that I've been putting out there about the absolutely vital, however underappreciated, role hitherto insufficiently appreciated, and increasingly but still insufficiently appreciated role of statistics in the real world, in serious decision making in serious decision making across a growing number of areas. And indeed, it's probably nonsensical to talk about any data analysis that isn't to some extent statistical. Um, in the same sense as uh, frequentism is still Bayesian, just, just because they you refuse to acknowledge certain realities doesn't mean they don't fall into one of them. That, does that make sense, Matt? Um, so, that was, that was a, well, how's, how are we done for time? Who's going to watch? Who's? 704. 704. So we're halfway. So, good. The first half of this talk was a little bit of friendly advice on what you might want to study to, well, certainly to get my attention um, if you want to work with me. And I suspect what will set you apart as an elite serious, or call it what you will, I don't know how long, much longer they'll be called data scientists, but whatever it is that real data scientists are, um, that's what sets you apart. Now, I think the rest of the talk should be devoted to that little thing which is, I, I'd say, dramatically inaccurately referred to as the real world. It's not real. It's far from real. It's about as real Okay, it's about as, okay, who here reads Dilbert? Who here who isn't Anne who reads Dilbert? <laughs> or the rain, or okay. Well, I read Dilbert and I think it's optimistic. <laughs> I read Dilbert and I think in terms, of, in terms of accurately portraying things that I actually see out there, or worse, things that I hear about secondhand. Because, okay, let's be honest, the really dumb stuff, it doesn't happen everywhere every day, but it happens very commonly. And when you're well networked, you hear about a lot of dumb stuff and occasionally you get to see it yourself. And I have to say, um, I don't think it's a comedy. I don't think it's a comedy at all. So in the sense of being a accurate portrayal of life in the business world, I think it's pretty accurate. Now, how real is that portrayal pretty real? But how real is the world it's portraying? How, how sustainable, how honest, how connected to the rest of the realities of the world, particularly the realities of keeping it afloat, is that world? And in my admittedly heretical, Opinion, the answer is not very. And that's fine if you're going into a job in a management consultant firm as a management consultant, or you're going into one of the professions, or you're even going to be a project manager. For most people in the business world, certainly for lots of IT functions, what I've just said is unhelpful, demoralizing, and irrelevant. Um, however, if you're going into data science, this is a very important fact. So one way to put it is the world is a little bit mad and a lot like Dilbert. But that just sounds unhelpfully negative and it doesn't tell you anything about data science in particular. So let me put it to you another way. Point one, if you think the world is ready for data science, you are wrong. What do I mean by that? If you think that most of the organizations out there, the big ones, the ones you the very visible big organizations, and note the two qualifications, because there may be organizations that are either not so visible or being not so big or both, but the very big, very visible corporations where it, it appears at least there are most of the roles, 
most of the money and most of the buzz around data science. In my opinion, a large proportion of them are not ready for data science at all. <coughs> now that would have been a completely uncontroversial thing to say 20 years ago. Right? Obviously they're not, and hey, what, what the heck is data science, by the way? We don't know what that phrase means 20 years ago. And 10 years ago, when people started hiring data scientists and waking up to the stuff, it was still not a really controversial thing to say. If I were to say what I just said in front of, I don't know, the HR person or the, you know, the head of digital or the CEO of any one of these organizations, they would be very, very angry with me and they'd give me lots of reasons why I'm wrong. And this is the second thing, like, it's a complete contradiction to the first thing. The second thing is, but usually, Spending, pick a number between one and ten, and put lots of zeros behind it. Right? They're spending that many zeros worth of dollars on data science. Yeah. Now pick a number between one and ten, and add one or two zeros after it. That's how many PhD level data scientists they have in the building. Yeah. Now pick probably the same order of magnitude in the hundreds. That's how many different maybe dozens in the tens. Okay. Pick in the tens the number of vendors, the number of big name software companies, the number of consultancy firms, the number of providers of goods and services in this picture. That's what they'll tell you about. They'll also tell you how supportive they are, how enthusiastic they are of data science. In fact, they may even have hired people whose job it is to be some champions. There are people in these organizations whose job it is to basically be cheerleaders and promoters of certain things. Um, now, on the one hand, I just said these organizations are not ready for data science. On the other hand, I just told you that they are absolutely ready, and heck, it's already in there, and I probably didn't even tell you that not only do they have all this, but they've had it for a while. And when I say a while, I don't mean a few years, I mean decades. I remember our big four banks presenting on their data mining capability 20 years ago. So every time they tell me, oh, we have a whole new function, we're really new to this space, I'm, no, you are not. I remember when you were doing this 20 years ago. However, the sense of novelty seems to remain the same in many places. Note how I'm very careful not to name any names and to tell you that it's not true everywhere, it's just true mostly. You may suspect that by mostly I mean nowhere, and you're welcome to suspect that. Um, but what I'm trying to say is that these organizations, for whatever reason, and speculating on those reasons, by the way, that's like a three hour talk, and there I really am not sure of what I'm saying. But for whatever the reasons are, they're very willing to Embrace whatever this buzzword of data science is. They're, they're very willing, they're very willing to spend enormous amounts of money on it. They're will, very willing to bring many of you, recent, maybe not so recent, um, graduates, postgraduates in this field, into the space. And yet, here's Eugene saying, but they're not ready for it at all. What do I mean by that? Well. This is where it pays for you to talk to actual data scientists who actually work in, in these organizations. And not just the one or two, talk to lots of them. Because what you'll find is that for the more serious ones, like people with actual PhDs and machine learning and PhDs and stats, they'll complain bitterly. They'll tell you how they're not treated with respect. They'll tell you how they're spending most of their time playing strange bureaucratic games or doing extremely boring work, not worthy of all the training they've done. They'll tell you all these things. And, but then you'll say, yes, but you're earning an enormous amount of money. And they go, yeah, but I'm probably planning to leave and go to a startup where I get half as much. Or they say, yeah, I'm staying, but it's just for the money. There's a lot of that about. There's a lot of churn in the industry, and this has been known for probably the better part of five years. It's just a truism that well, data science, there's a lot of churn in data science. Um, I have a better idea of why that churn is happening because I actually talked to a lot of these churn data scientists. And uh, it has to do with words like 
the person I'm reporting to has no idea about what I do and it doesn't even bother them. My job is incredibly trivial. The, the, the management doesn't understand the difference between building a really complicated neural network to solve a really difficult problem and achieve a high accuracy score and, I don't know, just moving a file from this system to this system. Uh, my colleagues will look, look on me badly because all I know how to do is build neural nets, but I don't know how to efficiently move from this system to this system. Uh, I feel like I get no support because I get no data. The hardware I get to use is only a four gigabyte laptop because as far as the company is concerned, I'm not a real power user of technology and now I don't get to use the cloud. We have a vendor that whose software we have to use, but I'm not allowed to download R or Python, or worse, I'm allowed to use R or Python, but only the five or six approved packages uh, out of the tens of thousands. So there are lots of things that are happening in large organizations, primarily due to the fact that in many places, data scientists are hired without any sense of why they're being hired, how to manage them, or who should manage them. And the question of, well, why is this happening? I have my theories. I have my theories. One of the reasons I'm saying this to you is I want you to avoid working in one of those places. I don't want you to end up working in a place like that. I actually have a video of, of, of a presentation that I did about a year and a half ago now titled Questions to Ask Your Prospective Employer. Because normally when I'm presenting to an audience of current data science practitioners, hands go up and at least one of those hands will say, how do I convince my manager to take what I do more seriously? And the answer is, you can't, it's too late. You should have ascertained what kind of workplace it is and what sort of boss you're going to have at the interview. But maybe, maybe you'll get another chance at your performance review, maybe, but you've got a much weaker shot. So what I'm trying to tell you is that we're in a very interesting and I think not very stable point in history. We're at a point where all this hype around AI has gone up, but we're also at a point where um, there's actually far less understanding, like there's a cru crucial lack of understanding among non-practitioners of this field. I don't think this point in history is going to last, but we are here now. So two little analogies for you. If you were to ask me, where is data science? If, if our analogy for data science was the internet, where would data science be? And most people probably want me to say, oh, it's about 2001, or it's about 2010, or it's only 10 or 20 years behind. No, I feel like we're in 1992. I feel like the browser hasn't been invented yet. Because I remember, I remember the difference between 1992 and 1995. I remember that that was the moment when the internet and computers stopped being something everybody knew about, but only a small subset of people did, to with the advent of the World Wide Web, of browsers, of the internet becoming visual, it suddenly became something everyone did. And that happened over the space of about three years. That has not happened with analytics yet. So I actually, again, have videos of courses I did. I just did, of course, of talks I did. I did one of these talks just on uh, so Tuesday, I just did a talk this Tuesday on the data literacy revolution. So just like computer literacy became a universal skill that we all have, there is going to be a data literacy skill which is required for people to be effective customers and managers of data analytics. It's not there yet, it's barely started. The other thing I'll, I'll say in the, um, the analogy of data science data analytics and the internet is the hype cycle. So lots of people say, ask me, well, where are we on the hype cycle? Is it all hype? Here's my answer. Yes, it's all hype. It's almost all entirely hype. Data science, AI, and analytics are completely and utterly overhyped. But, but, they're overhyped exactly the same way that the internet was overhyped circa 1995. Here I've moved my year a bit. I've moved my internet point from 92 to 95. In terms of development, we're in 92. In terms of hype, we're in 95. In terms of hype, everyone's now aware of it, but just about everything 
that you're hearing about from experts is bullshit. The one most important thing that I think is bullshit is any sense that the, the situation that we have now, the workflows, the work style, the roles, the role of analytics, that, that, that it's, going, it's going to be even remotely similar to what it is now in 10, let alone 20 years' time. I think that we are on the verge of a revolution. The revolution hasn't started. I can speculate about some of the ways in which things are going to look. If you really want to see how I, my speculations on the future of work, the future of analytics, I actually believe it's going to be the only job left. I'll also admit that these are rather, I think they're rather bold statements. I'm not 100% I'm not certain anything is true. I'm not 100% certain that's true. That's where I'm betting. <laughs> but again, if you know statistics, statistics is a language which gives you the ability to understand certain concepts. And one important concept is the idea of variance. So when it comes to the future of data science, um, I, I'm less bold about predicting the, the position than I am about predicting the variance. I think there's got enormous uncertainty, enormous dynamism in where this field is going and its role in society. Um, how are we doing for time now, everyone? I think this is a great time for questions. Well, thanks very much, Eugene. So I've got um, Ashwari and I are going to have mics. You take this one. And raise your hand and get a mic. I just want to know that you're talking about the timeline. So what's your what predicted timeline for the development? Um, look. Uh, you've just caught me in a feedback loop because what I wanted to say to you was whatever I predict, you probably want to multiply it by two. And I'm trying to be clever and do it myself, but I'm just stuck in a feedback loop forever. Look, I think we're going to see significant differences in the next five years in terms of, in terms of the, the purpose and role of analytics in organizations and the power shift between analytical and non-analytical people. Um, I think we're going to see radical transformation in about 20 years. Um, but this is, this, I do not vouch for these numbers. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks for a great talk. I wanted to scream amen a couple of times there. I you really agree be. with you. I should, should have. We could have both gone hallelujah. Yeah. <laughs> started talking. My, my favorite was when you called data science a buzzword. It's a uh, buzz phrase. Yeah, it's buzz phrase. Buzzwords. Yeah, yeah. Two, two buzzwords. It's also a brand. That's the other thing. It's a brand. Yeah. Yeah. I hope a lot of people listen to this talk as well because you know you have these uh, things these days I've seen a lot of Facebook ads and stuff like take this three uh, week course master data science and people actually sign up for these things and they probably get jobs as well. So oh well I should have said something else. The other thing about this very strange and almost time we have just a bit if you're really desperate to get a data science job right now I've got some good news for you if you want to take the easy path. Bad data scientists find it easier in workplaces than good data scientists. <laughs> because, good Amen. Data, because good data scientists say things like, that task is not a task, that's just a buzzword. You said, build me a neural network, you didn't tell me how or why. Uh, that's just a buzzword, that's not a business agency, that's not a business department. Or, I'd love to explain these results to you, but you'll need to understand how, how variance works in the three-dimensional space. Uh, you know, in other words, you want the truth, you can't handle the truth. Uh, <laughs> Management doesn't want to hear things like that. Or, or more and more pointedly, you want to forecast, here's the probability distribution. No, and the manager says, no damage, just give me the number, give me the point. Because now probability distributions are different for nerds. Um, it's, it's actually the case that being, being bad at data science but being a great conformist is probably better for your business survival at the moment than being a very good data scientist, unless you're working in a really good place. Now, the other thing I didn't talk about is where the really good places are. So you've said this, you, you, you heard me hammering the obvious places, the large corporates. But there's what I call the unforgiving space. The, the rather, rather weird, peripheral, uh, heterogeneous space of organizations that are doing things that are a bit more catastrophic if they get it wrong. Hedge funds. Sports betting funds, sports teams, 
political parties, countries at war, any organization facing existential risk on, on an, at a medium and ongoing scale. Uh, these exist. Sometimes there's something a little bit more simple, like a like like, like an online retail startup, perhaps, or maybe they've discovered a, a whole new way of uh, um, well, once again, betting on things. Like I was hearing about someone who developed a system for doing sentiment sentiment analysis based on web scraping and then placing bets on uh, political outcomes, which. Well, some of you may know I made quite a bit of money betting in the recent US election. But uh, you know, some people are making money this way a bit more consistently. So there is a whole, there is a growing, exciting, powerful new world where the stuff I'm talking about is not, is not science fiction. It's, it's there today. There, there are data literate, data hungry, data driven deciding cultures right now. And I'm waiting for, they're, they're like the little mouse-like rodents that uh, the dinosaurs didn't think were a threat. I'm just waiting for the comet. And I think Matt wants me to wind up. We have it. Well, we have a question. Another question. Ah, yes. Hi. Um, I, I really enjoyed your uh, comparison uh, to the early 90s. Um, I actually was picturing, the word that popped in my head was hot dog. And I was picturing the guys sitting in their sports car a month before everything fell apart. They had no money left. Um, when you started describing um, uh, these large corporations not being ready, um, you were talking about uh, it being a buzzword. One thing you didn't mention, and I'm wondering what you think, um, are, they, are they also not ready because they are not actually ready to act? When we go back 20 years ago uh, and compare to what we have now in, in the data sphere, our space. One of the biggest differentiators now is the pace of change. We don't have time anymore, or we have less time than we did to get things wrong and try and get it right. Okay. Even then, they weren't ready to act, but they had more time to think about whether they would or not. Now, do you think people, these organisations are actually ready to act on data science and what they what they get out of it? Objectively, the fast pace of change you would think would necessitate. Better decision making, not diminish it. So let's go. I, I, I didn't want to go there, but let's go there. First of all, there is no they. We're talking about in groups of individual human beings. Those human beings have their own incentives and their own levels of influence. At the end of the day, we're talking about C suite executives and we're talking about boards. We're also talking about the information funnels and other forms of perhaps non-compliance or slight disruption that occur down, down the bottom. In general, we're talking about a phenomenon you may not be familiar with. Uh, who's heard of the principal agent problem? So we're talking about the principal agent problem. We're talking about people seeking their own interests rather than the actual interest of the people they're meant to be serving, which is, the, which is the, the shareholders. Or if you're another for-profit organization, whatever, whoever your beneficiaries are. Um, I believe that, first of all, in most large organizations, certainly in this country, there is no decision pressure for most of these people. Most of these people do not suffer immediate adverse effects, <coughs> certainly not immediate adverse effects that could be shifted with a bit of a death politicking if things go wrong. So they're not, they're, there are more incentives to avoid decisions than there are incentives to make decisions and stand by your decision. That's the first thing. Analytics exists for one purpose and one purpose only to make good decisions when good decisions matter. So really, the question you're asking is, why don't, the technology's changed, the world's got faster, but what I'm not seeing is any real, unambiguous, and catastrophic immediacy of decision making for the supposed beneficiaries of Blue Analytics. I'm, I'm actually saying, I, I'm not seeing an acknowledgement that that should be a consideration. No, but it's not a consideration because of the way the incentives work. I mean, these people create their own, they're the bosses, okay? So you're saying, why, why aren't you concerned about this other thing? And if they were honest with you, they'd go, A, because it doesn't really help us, and B, it could help us marginally, but then we'd enter a world where all these people who are not our friends develop power and we lose ours. And thirdly, we got to where we are today with our ability to 
play wonderful political games and impress people like us with our charisma, with our influence. The existence of a framework of objective measurement diminishes our scope to do that greatly. Of course they don't like it. I want to put my tie-dye t-shirt back on. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right, anybody else? You were describing some of those conditions in the real or unreal world uh, in the industry now, which aren't really conducive to worthwhile projects being being done. Um, do you think that that will lead to more? Uh, data science practitioners as time goes on and as it gets easier to learn more accessible, sort of doing more independent work, more independent projects. So will there be a move towards actual product rather than being involved as a data scientist in big corporations? I see the most capable data scientists leaving large corporations and indeed leaving large consultancies as well. Um, this is why, well, as Warwick mentioned AlphaZeta, this is why I love AlphaZeta. So AlphaZeta is a way to create a home for extremely gifted, idiosyncratic, uncompromising data scientists and still give them a chance to add value to those organisations that really appreciate the top-notch data scientists and don't just want someone who says yes to things that don't make sense. Um, I think that that's part of the greater trend. It's not just about data science. I think the, the trend towards, I guess, portfolio careers, independence. I, I don't like the term gig economy because I think this is a, you know this is not a commodity job. Um, but you know you can think of it as, as a gig economy kind of phenomenon. I think that, that's a growing not, not shrinking trend. Um, I I wonder what it will take to give large organizations that right set of incentives. I, I wonder if it's an external economic shock. I wonder if just serious and ongoing hard economic times might might change. Like being, being in a situation where you're forced to make good decisions or else, which is what hard economic times do. I wonder if that's what will make a difference. All right, well, it's just past 7.30, so I think we'll draw the formal um, event to a close. Uh, you, Jane, we hang around here for any pressing questions that need to be asked. So let, join me in thanking uh, Dr. Eugene.